Uh, today, we're so lucky to have Dr. Tuckerman joining us for our grand rounds here at UH. My name is Kara, and uh, this week starts my first week as UH chief, so please uh, forgive all the missteps that I'm bound to make. Um, for uh, Dr. Tuckerman, so he is currently working at the Lewis Stokes VA uh, Cleveland Medical Center, but we were actually lucky enough to have him here in our residency program just a few years ago where he, after completing his residency, he went on to serve as chief resident for the 2015-2016 academic year. He graduated with an MD and PhD in biochemistry from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas in 2012. And then he braved the snow and came over to Cleveland where he did his residency and now works mostly clinically um, as part of the acute medicine section at the Lewis Stokes Cleveland VA Medical Center. And so we're so lucky to have you here talking about the mRNA vaccines. Dr. Armitage was uh, super excited for your talk today and uh, really wants to hear about um, the vaccine and how they're made. So Dr. Tuckerman, without further ado, I'll give the floor to you. Thank you, Kiara. I appreciate it. Um, so uh, thank you, Kiara. Thank you, Dr. Armitage, for, for the invitation. Um, I'm really thankful for the, the opportunity to come and, and talk to you guys a little bit more about the mRNA vaccine platform. Um, although I'll state from the very outset um, that this is not primarily going to be a talk about COVID-19. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit more broadly about the development of the mRNA vaccine platform, sort of how we got to the place where we could utilize this as a technology for COVID-19. So I'm really gonna be focusing really more on all of the work and all of the scientific breakthroughs that really helped lead up to the pandemic. So to a point where I think it's fair to say that we had this technology available to us really, if you will, just in time for the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, now, this talk is, is really primarily um, the product of just personal interest. I was, I was interested in learning a little bit more about this. Um, it was also the product of, of, of sort of discussions and questions that I was having with scientific colleagues, um, as well as with patients and, and, and having questions thrown at me that I didn't know the answer to back in around December that, uh, that I wanted to go and find answers to. And so I spent a lot of time learning and reading and, and whatnot. And I hope that what I'm able to share with you guys uh, is, is interesting and helpful. Um, because there's been a number of stories that I've been able to glean from this that I've, I, I've been helped by and, and I hope that I'm able to pass on to you as well. As you can see from the, the, the first slide, the, the CMA code for this is 43362 for any who are interested. So first off, I'm going to start with, uh, with disclosures of which I have none. I have no professional nor financial stakes in Moderna. Pfizer, BioNTech, or any of the, the, the mRNA vaccine makers. Um, now, what I want to do is just sort of go through a brief outline here. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to talk a little bit about sort of the, the history of how this, this, this came to be, some of the challenges in, in developing this vaccine platform, um, of which the three that I'm going to primarily talk about are, are, are the three that are listed there. We'll talk at the end a little bit about the production aspect of this, safety aspects of this, maybe some ethical considerations and future applications if we have the time for it. Um, now we're going to probably spend the majority of the time today talking uh, with uh, on section number two under challenges and specifically the issue of immunogenicity of of, of the uh, of the mRNA. So to get started, we'll talk a little bit of, uh, about some pertinent history as it relates to this, and and the the pertinent history I would say really dates back to about 1990 when there were the earliest reports at that time of using what's known as in vitro transcribed mRNA in animals. And please don't get, get caught up in this term in vitro transcribed or in vitro trans, transcription. 
really all that that term means um, is is it's creating an mRNA, if you will, from scratch, from the base nucleotides A, C, G, and U, using an enzymatic reaction from a DNA template. It's it's a way to create a synthetic mRNA, but a natural mRNA, if you will. Um, and, and once that technology was developed where you could actually make mRNAs or synthesize mRNAs, people put them to work and wanted to do, to do experiments with them. So the, the first sort of key experiment that was, that was done in this was really back around 1990 when, when a scientific group was actually able to take a reporter gene mRNA. And, and again, don't get, get too bogged down in, on the idea of a reporter gene. All that really means is it's a gene whose protein can be protein product can be readily detected, whether that's be visually or, or via a number of, of other means. But, but scientists back in 1990 actually took, the, took mRNA and they proved that if you injected it into mice in certain ways, you could actually get the protein to be produced off of, of, the, off of the mRNA. Um, and that, that, those studies were, were extended a couple years later when a group at the Scripps Research Institute was actually able to take a vasopressin encoding mRNA and inject it directly into the hypothalamus of a vasopressin deficient rat. And they, they were able to elicit a, a physiologic response uh, from the rat. And, and you know what you did is you made the vasopressin off of the mRNA. The vasopressin corrected the physiologic response def deficiency in that instance, which was correction of diabetes insipidus. Now, what I'll say is, is despite these early sort of proof of concept or proof of principle experiments, mRNA as a therapeutic really went into a bit of a pause for a number of years uh, after some of these, these foundational studies were done. And we're going to talk about some of the, the reasons for that as, uh, in, in the coming slides. Um, but then this, this technology really got a springboard or a boost again in, in the time period of roughly 2000 to 2010, when, when really two key discoveries or two, two major scientific advances were made as it relates to this. And, and we're gonna talk about those. That's gonna be the, the majority of our talk today is really talking about those two advances that, that came during that, that time period. And this culminated in 2012 with, with what was described as the first description of the first lipid nanoparticle encapsulated RNA vaccine that was made by Novartis. And that, that particular vaccine was developed by Novartis it really as a proof of principle, if you will. It was a proof of principle that this technology could be used, in this instance, it was used in rats to successfully vaccinate the rats against a respiratory virus, and it worked. Um, and I want to make just one initial point here, uh, sort of, sort of before going into this, this a little bit further. Um, and that is that you guys probably have heard, whether it's via the media, whether it's by patients, whether it's via a number of different things, critics of this technology, critics of, of these COVID-19 mRNA vaccines, that goes along the line of this, you know, this vaccine is so new. We don't know anything about it, so we can't really predict what's going to happen. This is just such new technology. I'm skeptical of it because it's new. But the response to that claim, I think, should be should be fairly clear from 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 this slide that we've had this technology in its current platform, in its current state of where it is right now for the better part of nine years, almost a decade. And, and that current platform that we're, that we're functioning off of is really undergirded by the better part of three decades worth of research into this, into this therapy. So this is really not some, if you will, some fly-by-night technology. This is a technology that's been in, in the works for the better part of three decades. Now, going forward from there, because of some of these early successes with, with the, this particular platform, our government's defense department took notice and decided that this technology was really worthwhile in terms of making investments into. And they really did that via what's called DARPA, which is shown here on the, or, or, or specified here on, on the slide. So DARPA stands for 
the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And DARPA is an agency that's committed to making investments in technologies that can help support our national defense, whether that be the defense of the country or, or the defense of our men and women that we send into harm's way via our military. Um, DARPA was, in, was, was the product really of the 1950s and the Eisenhower uh, administration and was, was actually developed as, as a, hum, a, a national humiliation, if you will. So Russia beat us to, to space. Russia beat us to space with Sputnik. And the, and the Eisenhower administration and, and, and our national defense at that point said, never again. Never again are we going to be allowed to be second in, in any of these technological advances. And DARPA was, the, was, the, was one of the things that was an outflow of this. Now, DARPA recognized around this time, circa 2012, um, the, the, the very practical threat of emerging infectious diseases, both to our, our, our national security as well as, as our men and women of the armed forces. And they recognized the need to have vaccine platforms that were faster and more agile than the, than the traditional ones, right? So if you're gonna be sending military troops into a place where there's, there's an ongoing infectious outbreak, you can't wait years for, for a traditional vaccine platform. You need something that's much faster and much more agile. Um, and DARPA is really involved in funding sort of high risk, high reward projects uh, that, that the NIH would never touch. And so around the, the time of 2012, DARPA um, made four significant investments in four large biotech companies that are listed here. So they made a large investment in Novartis, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and Sanofi Pasteur. Now, ultimately, after a couple of years, actually all four of those programs dropped their mRNA therapeutic program. Um, they, and they made that decision to drop the technology and drop the, their programs for it, really primarily due to long-term concerns regarding the regulatory approval for an entirely new vaccine platform. They saw that as, as, a, as a hurdle that they just didn't even want to try to cross. Now, at the same time, DARPA, in addition to funding for large corporations, they also made some smaller investments in some smaller companies as well. And they, they funded two smaller current mRNA technology companies. One was CureVac, which is a, a German company to the tune of 33 million in 2011. And then they invested in Moderna um, to the tune of 25 million in, in 2013. And then CureVac, and Moderna put this seed money, if you will, to work in terms of doing some, some early stage human clinical trials. And what's listed is, is what you can see. So, so CureVac in 2013 started doing um, human testing of a rabies vaccine, and they actually published phase one, positive phase, phase one trial, our results in 2017. And then Moderna got into this in 2015. Uh, their first foray into this was with an avian influenza vaccine. And they, again, positive results that were, that were published in 2017. Moderna, Moderna expanded their, their efforts here in 2016 when they, when they started doing phase one human trials of, of vaccines for CMV, chikungunya, Zika, and a, and a number of others. And they had had positive results from these. Um, and, and Moderna had actually planned on starting phase two of their CMV trial at the beginning of 2020. And then we all know what happened. Uh, the uh, pandemic came along that absolutely derailed their, their plans for that, but, but presented a new opportunity, if you will. Um, now, I, I want, before moving on, I wanna make a, a, a couple points here. Um, I think that the, the impact or the, the effect of DARPA funding during, during this time really cannot be understated because I think without some of these early phase trials that were conducted between 2013 and, and, and 2020, it probably would have been harder for both Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech to 
sort of go all in, if you will, on, on this technology at the time when we really needed it at the beginning of 2020, that, that, that had some of these early successes not actually happened prior to us getting into this pandemic, it probably would have been harder for, if you will, Moderna and, and Pfizer-BioNTech to really bet the house and go all in and, and say, we're all in on this technology. But they were because, because we had some of this preliminary information to, to go off of. And I think it's likely not an understatement um, to say that amongst the uh, amongst the vast amount of money that our government has spent on on this pandemic, that probably some of the most impactful money that they spent was the fifty eight million dollars that were invested in, in 2011 and in 2013. So I want to change gears now, if you will, and, and now talk a little bit about some of the scientific challenges that, that were presented in, in developing this, this vaccine platform over the course of, of the better part of, of, of three decades. And I'll say that, that, you know, this vaccine platform, I had its detractors or its critics through, throughout the time, um, at many of whom essentially would, would come and say, look, there's no way that this vaccine platform can work because of primarily these three three things that are that are listed here. Um, I'm going to go through each one briefly initially, and then we're going to talk about them more in detail going forward. So, the first is the is re really the the general instability of RNA as a molecule, and I think that anyone who's worked with RNAs in the lab can testify to this that these are these are just not stable molecules. Um, one has to go to pretty great lengths to keep RNAs from really just kind of falling apart. And that's primarily because these, these molecules are prone to self hydrolysis and they're very, very sensitive to degradation via RNA specific nucleases or RNAs. Um, and, and these RNAs are honestly, they're everywhere. They're ubiquitous. Um, and so it wasn't immediately clear when, 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 when this was put forth as a potential therapeutic, how you could actually keep the mRNA stable, um, stable enough for it to be mass produced, stable enough for it to be, you know, delivered to, 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 to far away locations, and then stable enough that when you inject it into a person that it's actually going to get to the place where it needs to be so that you can produce your antigen and actually make a vaccine. Criticism number two was that was that how in the world do you actually deliver the mRNA to where it needs to go? That, that, that it wasn't clear how, from an, from an efficiency standpoint, how you could actually get the molecule to where it needs to be. Um, you know, I mentioned at the outset that one of the, one of the early studies was done where they took mRNA and they directly injected it into the hypothalamus of a rat. Well, you can't obviously do that with, with humans. And it was very hard to see how, you, how this could be a scalable kind of thing um, from a delivery perspective. Because you could have the best message in the world, but if you can't get the message to where it needs to be, you're, you're out of luck. And then number three is really probably the biggest of the hurdles. Um, and that is, is related to the high innate immunogenicity of mRNAs. Um, and, and sort of the foundational principle here is that exogenously added RNAs are detected by the immune system as foreign. And you can see that this is a problem because before you would even get your mRNA into the place where it needs to be, your immune system is detecting it, mounting a response, destroying it. And if that's the case, you're never even going to make an antigen off of the, the, the mRNA itself. So th these seem like conundrums that, that just can't be, can't be solved. And, and I want to walk you through sort of how they actually were solved. Um, but before doing that, I, I want to just briefly sort of highlight a little bit more of just the complexity, the scientific complexity that actually went into this. And I, I apologize if some of this seems like it's getting a little bit too far into the weeds from a scientific perspective. Um, I hope not. I'm going to try to keep this as simple as I can. But I think it's important to really understand sort of the basis of this because, because I think you'll see just how much of a challenge this really, really was. So with this, I, I, I want to start by by sort of recalling to your mind sort of the, 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 the immune system and how the immune system is, 
has sort of two arms, if you will. There's, there's the innate immune system, and then there's the adaptive or acquired immune system. Um, and really the foundation of the in, innate immune system is comprised of these, um, these groups of what are known as pattern recognition receptors which are shown here on this slide as, as the, the yellow bars and the red bars and, and, and the blue bars. And, and these pattern recognition receptors, what they do is they recognize discrete structural patterns on invading microbes. So there's, there's very distinct patterns that are present on parasites and yeast and bacteria and viruses. And when these, when these receptors or sensors are engaged, they trigger or set off a signaling cascade that really begins the process of linking the innate immune system to the adaptive immune system. And you can see from, from this slide here, which is obviously an oversimplification of reality, but, but you can see from, from here that, that there are receptors for, for double-stranded RNA and single-stranded RNA that come from viruses. So, so this is one of the ways that, that viruses are detected by our, our innate immune system is via their nucleic acids, via their, their RNAs. And that's good news. That's good. That's a good thing that our body has this, this machinery in place that it can actually detect viral RNA and then link that to, to a, a subsequent response. But I think it should become fairly apparent fairly quickly that an mRNA is also a single-stranded RNA, and that when you try to, to import an mRNA into a cell, that mRNA can engage the very same the very same system that is set up to detect single-stranded RNA from viruses, and that's obviously a problem. I and and I want to show you even a little bit more of this in terms of you know, once this system is engaged, once a single-stranded RNA engages this system, what happens downstream and, and, and why this is even a bigger problem going forward. So I know that this is a little bit of a, of a busy slide and this is gonna be sort of the last one as it relates to this, but I think it's important to, to understand the, the concept here. So, so what's shown here is, is a mucosal surface with mucosal cells. Um, and what's shown here is the entry of a virus. The entry of an, an immunogen, and in this instance, the virus is the immunogen. Now, you could substitute mRNA in this and, 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 and the same things would be true. So the virus gets in and the virus stimulates or, 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 or activates a group of pattern recognition receptors that we, that we talked about on, on the last slide. And the, a number of things happen at that point that ultimately lead to what's known as the induction of an antiviral state. And this is primarily medi mediated by, by type one interferons and in what's called interferon stimulated genes or ISGs. And globally, the way that you can think about this of, of what's actually happening with this induction of an antiviral state is, is you can think from the perspective of a cell that's getting infected by, by, by a virus. You set off your warning signals. Okay, a virus has come in. This is danger, danger, danger. We need to do whatever we can to sort of stop the spread of this viral infection. And the way that that happens is really via two things. Number one, we know as a cell, if we're infected with the virus, that the virus is going to try to co-opt or use our ribosomes and our protein making machinery to try to make their own viral proteins. And so one of the things that we're gonna to do to try to stop the spread of the virus is to actually turn off the protein making machinery. We're gonna turn off those factories. And so that's done by globally decreasing protein translation locally. The other thing that's gonna happen is that we know that these viruses are gonna be bringing with them viral RNAs in the case of RNA viruses. So we're gonna upregulate RNAs activity to try to destroy as many messages as we possibly can with this. Now, I think it should be obvious with this that, that if you're trying to develop a vaccine platform using mRNA that can engage 
the innate immune system in the way that we've talked about, this all is very bad. Because remember, this platform is one where you have to get the mRNA and where it needs to go. And then you use the mRNA to translate your antigen that is going to be used in the case of COVID-19, the spike protein. But you can't do that if the cellular machinery is putting a block on all translation because it's sensing that there's danger out there and it's upregulating a number of RNAs that are just gonna destroy your message, right? This is, a, this is not a problem for the, the, the traditional vaccine platforms, but it's an exquisite problem as it relates to, to the mRNA technology. And, and it's not immediately clear how you actually get around this problem here. Now, an additional conundrum is that you have to stimulate the innate immune system at least a little bit to start linking up with some of the downstream things that lead to the adaptive immune response, right? You need to stimulate this at least a little bit to make some effector T cells and ultimately make some, some, some antibodies that are gonna be the foundation and basis of your vaccine. So you can see there's sort of this conundrum. There's, there's we don't wanna stimulate the innate immune system over here, because if we do, we're gonna, we're gonna struggle to actually man, make our antigen. But on the other side, we actually have to stimulate it over here on this side in order to make an effective vaccine. And you can see that this, this appears to be an incongruity for this particular vaccine platform that it's not immediately clear how this can be overcome. So I'm gonna transition now to, to sort of defining then sort of the two primary key discoveries that were made um, during that time period of 20, 2000 to 2010 that actually really springboarded or, or launched this, this technology into a, into a usable platform. And, and the first discovery or advance was really with, with the, the, the notion of improved delivery. And this is, as you guys probably know, this is where the lipid nanoparticle comes in, into play. And if we had more time, I would, I would spend a lot more time talking about this because the development of the lipid nanoparticle technology is actually really fascinating. There's a lot of really neat, tricky chemistry that goes into this and, and a lot of really just neat science that goes into this. But we don't have time for this. I wanna make sure that I wanna have, have some time to get to my second point, which I think is even more, more relevant and interesting. Um, many have called the lipid nanoparticle really the unsung hero, if you will, of the mRNA vaccine platform. Um, Again, the, the mRNA tends to be the thing that is, that is highlighted and celebrated as it relates to the vaccine platform. But the truth is you could have the best message in the world, but if you can't get it to where it needs to be, it's not gonna be effective. I will point out that this technology was actually co-opted from a, a sort of a different line of, of research, if you will. And that was the, the, the line of research that was related to RNA interference. And, and the details of which I'm not going to go over right now, um, but, but just as a, as, a, as a point of reference, um, RNA interference it was, just, it was a, a, a mechanism that was discovered in 1999. Nobel Prize was, a, was awarded to it in 2006. Um, and it was almost immediately recognized that the application of RNA interference um, was, was really great if you could get the small interfering RNAs to the place where they needed to go. So it was, this was a delivery problem as it related to that, that line of research um, at the time. But because of the immense potential application of RNA interference technology, heavy, heavy investments were made during that time of 2000 to 2010 into how do we deliver these small interfering RNAs to where they need to go. And the lipid nanoparticle was one of the, one of the offshoots or one of the, the solutions for that. And I mentioned that because I think it was really great that when, when we got into the time of, you know, post 2010, where, where the mRNA therapeutics really were, were coming of age, that we could really just draw off the shelf from an already ready-made um, delivery vehicle and just co-opt it, take it from the shelf and, and, and use it to, to springboard the mRNA technologies. Now, as it relates to some of the conundrums that we've already talked about, the lipid nanoparticle helps on a number of ways. It helps keep the mRNA protected. 
it helps with endosomal escape because one, what happens is the, the nanoparticle gets to the cell, it's, it's endocytosed, and then it, from the endosome, it needs to get out of the endosome and into the cytoplasm. And, and some of the surface molecules of the, of the nanoparticle actually help with that. Um, the lipid nanoparticle can actually be, be engineered to be as immunogenic as one would want it as well. It could be completely stealth or you could make it slightly immunogenic if you want. So, so there's a tuning or, or a help that can be, be of that as well. And this last point that I would, I would point out, I think is, 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 is sort of a fortuitous thing that, that, that came out of this as well, is that in, in August of 2018 was the first FDA approval of a lipid nanoparticle derived um, drug that drug is called Onpatro, which is a, a small interfering RNA therapy for a rare genetic disease. And the reason that I'm highlighting this is that this was just another regulatory hurdle that was, that was, that was accomplished outside of the, the realm of mRNA technology um, that really allowed us when we got to 2020 into our pandemic this particular regulatory hurdle of the FDA approving medicines that use this lipid nanoparticle technology, that had already been crossed. That had just been crossed within the last year or two prior to the pandemic and really helped speed the process of what we were actually able to do in 2020. So again, another sort of fortuitous thing that, 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 that happened to us as it related to, uh, to the development of, of this particular technology. Now I want to I want to change gears one more time here and, and talk to you about sort of the the second major discovery that was that was made or the second major breakthrough that was made with this and and this one is actually this is such a great story and I hope that I'm able to do it justice um, because I think this is a great story from a personal perspective of of the scientists involved in it. And obviously I think it's a great scientific story as well. And so I'm gonna do the best that I can to do this justice, but, but this is a story that I, I think is really fun and, I, and one that I, I want to be able to talk about. And it's the story of, of the impact of an immigrant from Eastern Europe um, and how her scientific discoveries really changed the entire landscape of, of this particular research field. And, and that immigrant from, from Eastern Europe is Dr. Catalin Carrico. Um, and this is such a great story. This is the stuff that honestly, that movies are made out of. Um, and it's really fun for me to be able to share this, this story with you. And I hope that I'm able to do it some degree of justice. Um, I, for anyone, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through this just a little bit. For anyone who's interested in learning a little bit more about this after I, I describe it, the two articles that I've referenced down here at, at the bottom are really more sort of popular science um, and, and are really profitable articles if anyone wants to go and learn a little bit more about this. Um, I'm gonna read just a little bit or excerpts from, from these two articles because I think that they tell the story a little bit better than I could in, in my own words. So I'm gonna read for the next minute or two, I'm just gonna read a little bit of excerpt from this to just to sort of set the stage for where the, the science actually is in, in this because I think it's, it's, it's really dramatic and, and, and really interesting. So the story goes like this, that Dr. Carrico was born in Hungary and during her school age years, she became interested in, in science generally and then, and then later on in, in RNA biology. She completed a PhD in Hungary and then emigrated to the United States in 1985 with her husband and their two-year-old daughter to pursue studies on mRNA as therapeutics. And the story goes that they, the, the family had $900 to their name when they emigrated to the United States a, 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 in 1985. And that $900 was, the, uh, uh, was the, the, the money that was the full sale of their car in Hungary on the Hungarian black market. And so they essentially came, that was all that they, they came to the United States with. So she accepted a job at Temple University in Philadelphia, but after four years of some progress, but little funding, she later switched jobs and was hired across town at the University of Pennsylvania in a tenure track position. However, by the early to mid 1990s, 
some of the early excitement surrounding mRNA was beginning to fade. While scientists had cracked the problem of how to create their own mRNA, a new hurdle had emerged. When they injected the mRNA into animals, it induced such a severe inflammatory response from the immune system that the animals almost immediately died. Any thoughts of human trials seemed impossible. It was a real obstacle, but Carrico was convinced it was one she could work around. Few, however, shared her confidence. She was quoted as saying, every night I was working, grant, grant, grant. And each time it came back, no, no, no. By 1995, after six years on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania, Carrico got demoted. She had been on the path to full professorship, but with no money coming in to support her work on mRNA, her bosses saw no point in pressing on. Carrico later explained, it was particularly horrible as that same week I had just been diagnosed with cancer. I was facing two operations and my husband who had gone back to Hungary to pick up his green card had got stranded there because of some visa issue, meaning he couldn't come back for six months. I was really struggling and then they told me this about the demotion. While undergoing surgery, Carrico assessed her options. She decided to stay, accept the humiliation of being demoted and continue to doggedly pursue the problem. Things changed though, when in 1997, she met Dr. Drew Wiseman, a respected immunologist who had just moved to the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Wiseman was intrigued by her work and offered her assistance. The two struck up a collaboration and they began trying to work around this immune reaction to injected or transfected mRNAs. And by 2004, they had made a major discovery. And that's what I wanna walk you through here over the next couple of slides. And the major discovery was this, is that different RNAs produce different immune responses. And I'm gonna walk you through sort of how they, how they found that out or how, how they, that sort of came to be. And I, again, I don't want to sort of get down all the way into the weeds as it relates to, to some of the this, this, this scientific uh, issues here. But I think that, that seeing this is actually really helpful uh, if, you can, if you can sort of wrap your mind around this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through this as best I can. So what's shown here is, is, a, is a group of experiments that were done where, where they're looking at, at the immune response that's, that's reported out as, as TNF-alpha from human dendritic cells based on transfecting different types of RNA. And what I want you to focus your mind on are the three places where there's bars with, with the stars, okay? So, so this one here, this one here, and this one here. So the Carrico and, and Weissman made the discovery that when you take your synthetically made or in vitro transcribed RNA, and, in, and transfected into these dendritic cells, it induces an immune response, which had already been known, that had been known for decades, that, that quite a robust immune response was, was made here. They also know that, that, that when you take whole RNA, total RNA from E. coli, a danger signal, a, a, an obvious non-self um, uh, organism, and transfect that into, the, into dendritic cells, it produces a robust immune response. But they also saw that when you take whole mammalian RNA and transfect that in, it looks like the immune response to that is markedly blunted. And it, it raised the question of, is there the existence of some sort of protective factors or non-stimulatory factors that are actually present within this group of, of RNA here that is not present here and not present here, right? That, that, that there's something physically within that pile of RNA that actually protects it or, or makes it non-stimulatory to the immune system. And then two more bars to, to focus on. It's interesting that when you, when, you, when you fractionate out the mammalian RNA into its various components and you, you take mitochondrial RNA and transfect that into, um, 
into these dendritic cells, mitochondrial DNA or mitochondrial RNA is immunostimulatory. So whatever whatever protective factor may have been present here in, in the total seems to be lost in the in the mitochondrial um, pool that's over here. And interestingly enough, too, when you look at E. coli as well, there was the whole E. coli RNA is immunostimulatory, but it looks like when you take the fraction out of that, that's just their transfer RNAs, these have lost some of that immunostimulatory uh, I, um, property, suggesting that there might be some of that protective factor, if you will, present in this fraction here of the, of the E. coli tRNAs that was not present in the whole. So it begged the question of what is it? What, what is this protective factor or factors that, that seem to be present in, in, in certain portions of these, of these RNAs? And I need to step back for one second before getting into the, to the, to the final uh, uh, reveal or, or result of this, if you will. And just as a reminder, uh, remind you all of, of sort of the, the common building blocks of DNA and RNA. So, so DNA uses the, the, the basis A, C, G, and T. RNA uses A, C, G, and U. And these are the, the common four bases that are used in, in RNA and DNA. And specifically for RNA, it swaps out U for T. But we've known for decades that, that in addition to these four common nucleotides, that there exist more than a hundred modifications of these four, four uh, bases here that exist naturally within cells. That we've known for decades that, they, that, that, that there's a whole variety of different nucleotides that exist within cells. It's just that we knew they were there, it's just we didn't really fully understand what they were there for or, or, or their, what's the full implication of having these, these, this broad array of, of, of nucleotides within cells. And I'll show you this just, just very briefly here. You know, if you look here at, down here at, at the slide where it says um, mRNA, if you go looking hard enough within eukaryotic mRNA, in addition to finding the traditional A, C, G, and U within mRNAs, you can find all sorts of other nucleotides that have been substituted in. Oftentimes they're substituted in at, at fairly low levels, but you can find them there. tRNAs, which are, which are shown up here, are heavily, heavily modified um, in all, all forms of life. And we really don't understand why is this? Like why, why incorporate these, these, these alternatives to the typical A, C, G, and U um, into, into these nucleic acids? Carrico and Wiseman made an interesting correlation. Um, and they, they, they made the correlation that it seemed as if the RNAs that were immunostimulatory, when you looked at them in terms of how frequently you found non-canonical nucleotides in them, so non-A, non-C, non-G, non-U, the answer was very infrequently. So these tend to be non-modified nuclear or, or, or RNAs. Comparatively, those RNAs that seem to be non-immunostimulatory seem to incorporate the non-canonical nucleotides at much higher rates. So more than more than 3% going up to the to the place of roughly every one in four base being something that's not A, C, G, or U. And so that really begged the question of, could we actually make an mRNA? And instead of putting in the traditional A, C, G, and U, could we actually substitute some of these alternatives in there and potentially make that MR, change the mRNA from being stimulatory to not stimulatory? And the answer was yes. So if you look here at Again, this is a TNF production. If you look at, at an unmodified RNA in terms of its immunostimulatory uh, property, you can see that it, it causes an immune response. But if you take that mRNA and swap out, instead of using the traditional cytosine, you swap in 5-methylcytosine, which is a naturally occurring uh, uh, nucleotide within, within cells. This now is non-stimulatory. 
You can do the same thing with swapping out the, the traditional U for pseudouridine, which is a, a commonly found nucleotide. When you do that swap out, your RNA is now non-stimulatory. And so this was a foundational or breakthrough moment as it relates to this technology of realizing that if we modify the bases of these, these RNAs, we could make them more stable, we can, we can make them non, non-stimulatory, and that opens up this technology to all sorts of different options of, of therapy. Now, this discovery was not immediately met with a, a whole bunch of fanfare, but there was someone who, who immediately recognized the utility of that, and that was, that was uh, uh, Dr. Derek Rossi, who was a postdoctoral researcher at Stanford University at the time when this got published, who read this article while he was at Stanford and realized immediately the, the potential utility of this. He shortly after moved to the Boston area and with three others founded Moderna as an mRNA therapeutic uh, organization because they realized that if you had an mRNA that was non-immunostimulatory, you could do all sorts of great things with it. And so Derek Rossi, if you, if you read about it, he will say that it was this line of experiment that honestly was the foundation for, for Moderna as a company. Dr. Carrico and Dr. Weissman, they also realized the, the, the applicability of this. And so they licensed the, this, uh, this technology to a small German mRNA biotech company called BioNTech, which all of you know of it, at, at now as well. Um, and I, I, I want to sort of end this, this portion of, of the discussion um, because, because what ended up happening was, was that um, Carrico and Weissman from the time of 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, repeated these experiments, showed that they, you know, built upon them, um, had done some really amazing work after that. In 2013, Dr. Carrico decided that she was going to uh, uh, leave the University of Pennsylvania and she accepted an offer to become the senior vice president at BioNTech in, in Germany. Um, BioNTech established their US headquarters in the Boston area and she, she took that, that opportunity. But she took that opportunity and this is this again is, is just one part of the really interesting part of, of the story here. She took that opportunity to become senior vice president at BioNTech only after the University of Pennsylvania refused to reinstate her to the faculty position that she had been demoted from in 1995. And she later said, they told me that they had a meeting and concluded that I was not of faculty quality. And she says, when I told them I was leaving, get this, they laughed at me and said, BioNTech doesn't even have a website. And you can imagine who's laughing last in, 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 at this one now, as, as of today, BioNTech has a market capitalization of approximately 26 billion US dollars and is at the very forefront of getting us out of this awful pandemic. So I think that this is just such a great story um, that I, I, I'm glad that I had the opportunity to, to share it with you. Actually, it actually goes a little bit further as we're talking about sort of, sort of immigration. Um, I, Carico's daughter, who was two years old when, when they emigrated to the United States, she got into rowing, like the athletic endeavor rowing, um, and was a great college athlete, ended up on the U.S. national team as a, as, a, as a rower, and actually won gold medals in both the 2008 and 2012 Summer Olympics. So it's just a great family story, and this is obviously such a great story from, from, from the perspective of science. So just to summarize, if you take some of these traditional nucleotides, um, specifically uridine, and swap uridine out for a modified version of either pseudouridine or N1-methyl pseudouridine, you can actually make mRNAs that are less immunogenic, they're more stable, and they're more easily translated, things that are absolutely crucial when you're actually making an mRNA vaccine platform. And that's why if you actually look at the sequence of the, of the, the mRNA that, that BioNTech made, you'll see that it has here, it has the traditional 
A, C, G, but then every place that there was a U, they swap it out with a pseudo U because they, they realize the importance of, uh, of doing that. Now, just in the few minutes that are left, I want to talk just very briefly about sort of issues of production safety and, and ethical considerations. Um, this is actually real fast. I'm only going to spend two minutes on this. So as it relates to production, this is actually a very easy thing to do from, 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 from the, the course of taking some nucleotides, in this instance, ACG and, and pseudo U in this instance, you do an in vitro transcription, which is a cell-free uh, uh, reaction off of your template. You make your mRNA, you purify it, you've got purified mRNA, you mix it with the various components of the lipid nanoparticle, and you've got your lipid uh, nanoparticle encapsulated mRNA. Honestly, for places that are, that are set up to do this, you could honestly do this in a day or two. And compare that to the weeks to months worth of production that is, that is required for the, the, the typical or traditional uh, vaccine platforms. This is a leap forward as, as it relates to the technology. It's also a leap forward in terms of these are all common readily available materials that are used here. This is easy to scale. It's easy to adapt or modify. You just change your template. And, and, and more, even more importantly, this doesn't invi involve any viruses. It, does, it involves no cell culture of any kind. There's no cells used in this whatsoever. So it gets around any potential ethical consideration as it relates to using certain kinds of, of cells and culture. You don't even have to worry about this with, with this technology because there's no cells in this whatsoever. Safety is another great thing with these because there's no viral vectors, there's no adjuvants, there's no chance of the mRNA getting integrated into the, into the genome. And the message really just degrades naturally over the course of a couple of days to a couple of weeks. So, so it's not something that you need to worry about the, the drug staying around in the system for, for an extended period of time. And I'll end with this sort of, you know, potential future applications of, of, of this technology, I think are fairly obvious, at least some of them. You know, obviously we can use this for, for other kinds of infectious diseases. That's what this was developed for and what DARPA had gone to the links of, of funding this for uh, all the way back 10 years ago. To some degree, this, this might be able to be used for, for at least transient protein replacement therapies. It's already being used for, for cancer vaccines. In fact, BioNTech in Germany, that's actually what their, their modus operandi is. They are a cancer vaccine company, and they happen to partner with, with Pfizer as it relates to the COVID-19 vaccine. But they, they're, they're, they're primary focus is on cancer vaccines. And I think the last one here is, is potentially quite interesting as it relates to regenerative medicine. Um, some of you will know the story of induced pluripotent stem cells that, that was the story that, of Yamanaka from the better part of a decade ago, um, of how Yamanaka was able to take terminally differentiated cells and via the introduction of four transcription factors, convert them into pluripotent stem cells. The challenge with, the, with his methods are the, cha the challenge of transfecting in those, those transcription factors and the number of things that you need to do in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, cell culture and, and a number of other things. This particular technology really suits that, that methodology quite well because you could actually transfect in the mRNA for the four different transcription factors that you're interested in making in skin cells or whatever it happens to be. And via some, 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 some traditional methods, you can actually presumably make those into your induced pluripotent stem cells in such a way that this is now something that can be used more broadly rather than, than, than what the, the process of Yamanaka was. Um, I give you my references at the, at the end here. Um, if anyone's looking for sort of a good general uh, uh, review, I would, I would point you to number one here. But if anyone's interested in just sort of the more popular science as it relates to this of some of the things that I described, numbers 10, 11, and 12, you will not go wrong with. Um, and, uh, and with that, I will, I will end. We've got a couple minutes left if there happen to be any, any uh, questions at all. Jason, that was fantastic. We're, we're, we're applauding, though, you know, we are, we are virtual. So, I mean, the, the comments in the chat just are really amazing. People really grateful, uh, you know, for, for, for the, this history, the storytelling, the science, it's really fantastic. Um, one of my questions you answered in the next to last, or, or you know, in, in the end, 
you know, I heard about this technology and, and uh, you know, I wondered, do we, do we get this mRNA and do we make spike protein forever? But, uh, but, it, but it naturally degrades. And is that just like the half-life of mRNA? So it can be tuned to whatever you want, honestly, uh, based on, based on, on a couple of different factors. So, so based on the level of substitution that you do for the, for the, for the nucleotides, as well as based on the codon usage and the codon optimization of the, of the, the mRNAs. In fact, CureVac, uh, the, the company that I talked about all the way at the beginning, um, they, instead of using the modified nucleotides, they're actually, they're, their vaccine that is that is in the works right now, they actually use it based on on codon optim optimization rather than than swapping in uh, other nucleotides. And and based on those two factors, you can make this as as it goes away in a day or two, or you could make it go away in in a week or two. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, good. I don't know. I mean, uh, pe people are again. Uh, expressing their gratitude for such a wonderful talk in the chat. If people have questions, we have a couple more minutes. I will say that, that uh, you know, the, the references that are here, the numbers 10, 11, and 12, I, I think are, uh, are, are, they're just great stories to, 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 to go and read. It's, it's, I think it's great how, how, there's been a number of people who have sort of engaged this story and, and, and made it in such a way that it's accessible to, to, to a number of people. Because I really think the story of Dr. Carrico and, and what she was able to do is it's just mm -hmm. such a great personal story and, and, and such a great uh, story of breakthrough of science, especially yeah. in, this, in, in the light of being demoted and a yeah. cancer scare and, and, and all of these things. Um, I, I think it's something that, that I wish was more, more widely known. I mean, it's, it's kind of the, the stuff of movies, if you will. Well, well, we'll look for that on Netflix soon. I'm sure there's no question there'll be a movie about, about her in particular. Maybe, maybe it's awesome. One, one of the questions from, from Paul Shanek was, um, what, what do you think you know, like the next you know, use of mRNA will be in medicine? So I sort of suspect that it's going to be in protein replacement therapies, um, or at least at least temporary protein replacement therapies. Although I, I, I think it's probably an unanswerable question because I think that that each of those things that I mentioned at the end, I think are all are are all possible applications. I think the most the most interesting of them is truly the regenerative medicine thing, where where you could potentially take skin cells easily trans make them into induced pluripotent stem cells and put them back in to make a, a an intervertebral disc or a you know a, a knee joint or whatever it happens to be um obviously a lot more needs to go into that but i think it's it's a technology that's there for for the use i think yeah well that was awesome um i i don't see any more questions again matt posted that we'll uh we'll have this talk posted. I'd, I'd like to post it on Facebook. That's okay, Jay. Don't Please do. No, I'd be happy um, with it. I, you know, I had really, uh, really excited and had high expectations for this talk and, and they've been surpassed. So again, thank you so much. Pleasure's mine. Thank That's you. Awesome. Thanks everybody.